Yes, uh, first I would like to give thanks to Pau for organizing a session here this last week, which has had great balance, a lot of interesting talks, interesting discussions, both uh, in and out of the room. And uh, I appreciate this. And it'd be great if this sort of thing were to continue in subsequent years. So thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, as you recall, uh, we had decided on various science goals here. Uh, including things like the dynamics of the extreme or intermediate mass ratio in spirals, the properties of the massive black holes, the properties of their environments, and things like cosmological inferences and also tests of general relativity. Now, before, however, going through to that, uh, I want to uh, mention something that Pete uh, Bender emphasized to us a few times, which is that if one thinks more broadly about Lisa astrophysics goals, it is useful to categorize these. And three categories is a traditional number for various reasons. Too many more, and you don't really uh, have anybody paying attention, like now. Uh, or <coughs> uh, And too few, and you don't really, well, it, it seems like you've got a, a one-shot deal. So what his suggestion is that the focus would be on uh, sources. And if this is the way you would go for massive black hole binaries, this uh, would relate to, for example, structure formation in the early universe, a key phase not easily treated by uh, any other type of probe, say electromagnetically, uh, and probably won't be 10 years from now either. I mean, we'll have understanding that's better than now, but there's still many things to learn. Intermediate mass black holes, uh, as, for example, seeds of the growth of million solar mass black holes, uh, the, in most reasonable scenarios, they have to pass through such a stage. And if anything more local nearby can be seen to uh, give light on that, this would be very interesting. And then, of course, Emory is the focus of uh, this particular session, the dynamics and environment. And there was uh, some open question we didn't resolve of whether the intermediate mass ratio in spirals should be here or should be in the intermediate mass category. There's obviously not a complete distinction. But this is just more of an overall thought that Pete has emphasized to us. So then let's talk about uh, the Emory and Emory issues that the uh, even group managed to get to. Uh, the first thing is the issue of data analysis. And uh, this is something where I personally felt I learned uh, quite a good deal. A lot of my understanding has been clarified greatly here. It is clear, uh, given today's talks as uh, well as previous ones, that there's still a lot of work left to be done in terms of the algorithms and also in terms of the basic general relativity understanding of radiation reaction and so on. However, it is also clear uh, to me now much more than it was that if this is successful, we have a great uh, thing that is going to happen. Because the phase is going to be followed over so many cycles, roughly 10 to the 5 was mentioned, but certainly between 10 to the 4 and 5 for most of these objects, it implies that it is definite that you're going to know both masses, the black hole, uh, massive black hole spin, and eccentricities to very high accuracy because otherwise you lose many cycles and you wouldn't detect it. So if you detect it with the templates that would be available, you'd know all these things. And you would know them with a precision of maybe uh, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 in the appropriate dimensionless quantities, which is more than enough for what would be needed for astrophysics. So this is a very good thing to hear. So if the data analysts do the job, then it is gulp up to astrophysicists to know what to do with it. So with respect to that, at a basic level, let us suppose that in the few year lifetime of LISA, there are on the order of 100 to 1,000 Emery's detected, Emery's, Emery's, whatever. This means that this will immediately be the uh, most extensive in terms of total number, and also by far the most precise distributions of supermassive black hole masses and spins and also stellar mass black hole masses. To give you an idea, currently, uh, the most precisely determined uh, supermassive black hole masses are pro probably the one in the galactic center, but those are also a major source. We're talking here, if you're relatively optimistic, about something on the order of 5 to 10% uncertainty. Whereas the very worst determination, if you detect it from an emery, is going to be far better than that. So not only will you have the largest catalog, but you will have all of the best determined ones, also for spins and also for stellar mass black hole masses. This will, of course, be quite valuable. In addition, 
since many of the emeries, when they get into the LISA band, are going to be quite compact in their orbits. This means that we'll have information about the eccentricity, say, or other characteristics of orbits within a few astronomical units of massive black holes. Right now, the closest orbits we are aware of to massive black holes of small objects come possibly within 40 AU at periastra, and these are the ones in the center of our galaxy. So this is a unique space of dynamics to explore. So together, these distributions certainly contain or encode information. It is uniquely valuable on the growth and uh, evolution of supermassive black holes, stellar evolution at the high mass end, and also not just Newtonian, but as we have heard today and in other talks, uh, relativistic orbital dynamics, post-Newtonian, for example, at the high level. And so this is quite important. Now, the challenge is to take this information from LISA and turn it into astrophysical inferences. Not necessarily a trivial enterprise, because as you've heard throughout this week, there are many scenarios that people have discussed for how you get emeries. Nonetheless, even at this instant, if we were right now prov provided with a LISA catalog that fell through a time portal, even with current understanding, there are things that we would be able to get without having absolute certainty about the models. So at a simple level of the data, correlations would be interesting. Here are some examples. If you look, for example, at the uh, spin or of the supermassive black hole versus the mass of the black hole, or orbital eccentricity versus uh, the mass, systematic trends that we see in the data might tell us a lot about how the dynamics depends on the central mass. There are some aspects of the problem that probably do not scale. In other words, unlike black holes themselves, which are basically the same whatever mass, if you have a, the same dimensional spin, the dynamics that are involved have different scalings, and therefore it could be that this will tell us uh, interesting things directly. The same with a stellar black hole mass or, and, and orbital eccentricities. Various mass segregation issues might be illuminated like that. If emeries can be seen far enough out, and I guess redshift of one is a, a very reasonable prospect, then the luminosity distance distribution could tell us about the evolution of the supermassive black holes particularly if, as X-ray information suggests now, the black holes in the LISA mass range are most likely to have gained a lot of their mass recently, unlike the very high mass black holes, which probably grew much earlier. So it's within that range that we might learn some things. In addition to that, uh, another aspect of the cream off the top, relatively straightforward, would be that you can have what you might call unusually informative events, the odd things that for which even a single example is going to tell you something. Examples are here. Suppose that you have an emery with a 50 solar mass secondary. Just one of those, one anywhere in the universe, tells you that it is possible to get black holes of that mass, probably from stellar evolution, in contradiction to much of the understanding in the literature about how black holes are form formed now from massive stars. If you have a 1,000 solar mass secondary, then even if it is the case that the existence of intermediate mass black holes had been established by 10 years from now, even if so, this is immediately an interesting point because it says that such black holes not only form, but can sink to the center in reasonable time, something which is not a certainty at this point. Having a, at least a few uh, zero or very small eccentricity events tells you that the scenario that has produced these is not what I set up on Monday as the standard scenario of single objects passing through and having gravitational captures. Instead, it would immediately point to things like uh, tidal splitting of a binary or possibly evolution through an accretion disk. This would be uh, something that would be quite informative. Or what about a primary? A billion solar mass black hole, just one of them, with the spin uh, parameter of, say, 0.1 or 0.01, something very small, would tell you that you had to have growth by probably mergers at random angles rather than accretion for long periods, which tends to spin things up. So again, none of this information requires detailed modeling. So of course, detailed modeling uh, will continue to be done. And by the time LISA is launched, we hope to be able to take the whole distributions and learn very important things from them by uh, backtracking through models. But even if there are uncertainties there, 
um, this, uh, these individual types of events and correlations are going to tell you a great deal. Now, we did not discuss as much about the cosmology issue, which was the fourth point, or the GR test, which is the fifth point. The cosmology, uh, the basic reason is that, well, you can think of cosmology in different ways. If it's a matter of getting cosmological parameters, like omega matter and omega lambda, uh, my feeling is that this is likely to be better obtained by electromagnetic observations, although if you get electromagnetic counterparts to any of these objects, good luminosity distance and good electromagnetic counterparts, then these might compete. Uh, but counterparts to Emery's are a very uncertain issue. Structure formation, another aspect of cosmology, is likely to be within the LISA realm, better probed, indeed uniquely probed, by massive binaries rather than the Emery's, because the Emery's are not, at least standard Emery's at 10 solar mass into a million, are not going to be visible at the redshift of, say, uh, 5, 10, 20, where there's a, a great uh, murky question mark over how things happen. As far as, uh, but, uh, but uh, it is going to, the Emery's are going to tell us possibly about some of the evolution of the low mass black, supermassive black holes. So it's not, it's not that it can't say anything, it's, a, it's not quite fitting in these categories. For the tests of general relativity, uh, our particular group didn't happen to have uh, enough expertise in it to say a lot definitively. In fact, I do note the rather stunning statistical anomaly that somehow uh, uh, there were only nine people who managed to make it to the even who uh, d had those birthdays. And Sam, who was shanghai because he was actually working on an NSF uh, proposal and just happened to be sitting in the wrong place. So miraculously, the statistics worked that way. So what a shame. Uh, but we did have uh, certain questions that I guess require an odd perspective, and perhaps Mark or others will discuss this. Uh, a comment that was made is that you might be able to detect a horizon. This would be sort of a robust test. I talked to uh, Bernie Schutz a little bit at lunch about this. I guess the issue is that if you have, say, a, a boson star, you could imagine the in spiral frequency increasing as it approaches, and then once it goes inside, it'll decrease. And so that sort of change in frequency might be a signature that all is not well. But the other way around, if it does work, how do you get definitive confirmation of a horizon is not clear to me, and that perhaps can be discussed. So that's uh, all we had, and I guess Mark is now going to present the odd perspective. Mac, uh, a Mac addict somewhere <laughs> who can explain why it's so. Maybe I can change the resolution. It was. I mean, the point is that not the whole. Uh, it's it's not mirrored actually. It's just part of my screen which okay, there. No, that would be a simple. Yeah, they have the same resolution. Mm, no, 
I think that's fine now. Okay. Yeah, because you have the whole uh, title bar. Thank you. It is quick. <laughs> Just slow. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, <coughs> so that's just again uh, a list of the five categories of questions we had, and I think I will be able to go quickly over most of them because, well, what we've reached as conclusions or the way we phrased the questions were not so different from from the other group. Oh, by the way, I want to apologize because probably what I will give is a quite personal view of what we have discussed. So. Uh, after in the discussion, we, you can uh, well correct me if I have misrepresented uh, well the opinion in the group. So again, we have these different channels. Uh, well, so far people have sort of basically three channels, which will uh, yield very different um, kind of orbit when the object is in Lisbon. So the standard spherical cluster with relaxation will be a relatively large eccentricity, easy to detect and probably a random inclination, although they may be biased. I mean, it's easier to detect, apparently, uh, an, an emery which occurs on a prograde uh, orbit around a fast-spinning black hole. So even if the star cluster is, uh, well, is isotropic around the black hole, and even if emery is occurring in an isotropic way, it does not mean that they, are all, they will be detected uh, equally uh, independent of the inclination angle. Now you have the binary tidal splitting or tidal capture of the of a core of a giant, as uh, suggested by Melvin. Then probably the eccentricity will be very small, maybe not strictly zero, so maybe it's still uh, detectable. And uh, again, the inclination angle should be random. And then you have disk processes, by which I in, well, in which I include formation of stars in a disk or capture of stars by an accretion disk, like uh, suggested by uh, Jordi. In this case, you expect to have a very, well, nearly strictly uh, circular orbit, and very likely to have also an orbit which is equatorial, in the case of a K black hole. Although, we have discussed a bit the possibility that uh, there may be some warping, because the disk does not need to be uh, aligned with the spin of the black hole. So this is a well, I think studied phenomenon, phenomenon, but what we don't know, <laughs> at least I don't know and I don't think we reached a conclusion about that, is whether, so the disk will be maybe warped, so the global orientation of the disk may be different from the, the orientation of the spin of the black hole, but maybe the inner edge of the disk will be still be locked in the equatorial plane. This I don't know. I, if it's the case, then you can, ask, you can expect that the, eventually the inspall, if the Stop stays in the disk, the inspiral will still occur in an equatorial uh, fashion. Um, well, again, precision of eccentricity and inclination measurements should be more than enough to distinguish the different, uh, different scenarios. Actually, <coughs> I understood that it's, it might be possible to detect very small eccentricity, a few, uh, a few percents, and I think then uh, the eccentricity of some of the tidal scenarios might not be strictly zero, so this may be detected, which would be nice. Which would be another way to probably to distinguish between these two possibilities. Uh, well, that's a slightly different uh, issue, but it was raised during this, uh, <laughs> when we were discussing this point, was about this uh, uh, funny or interesting uh, uh, zoom while phase. And I understood that it is of very short duration, it's when the star is nearly on an unstable orbit already, 
And I understand also that in order to, uh, to produce uh, something very significant in the signal, it has to occur with still a uh, uh, large eccentricity, I mean, at the moment of plunge. And then I think, well, I cannot think of, uh, of a channel which will produce an eccentricity which is still, I don't know, maybe 0.1 at the moment the star plunges. I think even for the most extreme uh, eccentricity that are found in the standard scenario where the eccentricity at the beginning of the evolution maybe 0.5 or maybe up to 0.7 I have the feeling but you may correct me that at the moment of plunge the eccentricity will be uh, close to zero. part of well it's the end of the the end of the waveform basic yeah so well, I was a bit of confused because I was thought okay it's very short you can more or less forget about it maybe that's a another statement but then it means that everything that happened at the end uh, doesn't does not matter which is also uh, an issue about well detecting of detection of a horizon or what else well a ring down so Probably for the brightest events, this still matters. This still uh, will contribute. Signal to noise ratio will still be uh, actually detectable. Yeah. So actually, I knew it, and I forgot to. <laughs> yeah. So this means that it's, it can be non-zero if you start with the last. Yeah. OK. OK, the last point here, maybe we should uh, well, finish and then have a more general discussion. I don't know. That was what we, we planned initially. Uh, the last point uh, is that I understood that if the eccentricity is more than about 10%, then one could uh, detect the third har harmonic in the quadrupolar approximation, even if the second harmonic is out of the Lisbon, which means that uh, one can probably, well, if one is lucky, uh, probe black holes that are more massive. Of course, this also, well, uh, another aspect of this is the rotation of the black hole. So I think, again, as I said in my talk, one generally goes, one says that the most massive black hole that can be detected is around, around 10, to the, 10 to the 7 solar mass. But I think this is generally assuming that they are not rotating. So if they are rotating fast, you can go to higher frequencies. Uh, Low mass objects, so, <coughs> well, that's a, a simple but important point, is that it will be a very <laughs> indirect way, or in no way at all, to probe the mass function of the objects that are inspiring because of mass segregation first, and because the more massive an object, well, the, the larger distance you can detect it. Well, this you could actually model uh, well, take into account in an, in an easy way. It's an easy bias, I guess. But the mass segregation uh, will make the most massive object massively overrepresented, which, in a sense, is a bad thing if you want to know what the mass function of stellar black holes, say, or compact remnants in general, is. In, another, if, in a more positive way, you can say, okay, well, that's a nice way to select the most massive black holes, stellar black holes, which are otherwise quite difficult to, uh, well, to have any information about because they are probably very rare. So maybe uh, LISA will, will allow us to put some kind of lower limit on the mass, on the maximum mass that a stellar black hole can have. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30 solar mass. And if such an object, I mean, if a few of these objects are in galactic nuclei, uh, I do believe, although I haven't checked this, I don't know if anyone has, that they, I mean, they will easily become emeries even if they start at a large distance because mass segregation will be more efficient. And again, you can detect them to a large distance. So even if they're very rare, there are two reasons why emeries should be 
a good way to, uh, to detect them. Another point is that this is true uh, basically for the standard scenario. And so there is some uh, information, some model, modeling has been done for this, but no modeling really has been done for this at all, as far as I know, or only very indirect. Uh, we don't know at this point, when you are splitting binaries, um, what kind of bias you are introducing in the mass function. It's not true, apparently, that you always capture the most massive star or predominantly capture the most massive star, as it would be the case if the three objects have uh, stellar mass. The fact that it's a massive black hole changes things. So that's an analyse analyse that uh, I think remains to be uh, to be done to see what kind of bias uh, you introduce in, in this process. Maybe, in an indirect way, uh, the detection of hypervelocity stars in our galaxy, and maybe from other galaxies as well, can be used to, uh, to constrain this kind of scenarios, this kind of models. But there are so many uh, observational bias, in particular, <laughs> to be uh, taken into account that one. Uh, that's maybe a too optimistic a way. But at least it tells us, well, it, it's an argument in favor of the fact that these binary splitting events actually happen. Okay, just an, a bit a smaller side about the S-stars uh, that well, Tal and, um, and this morning Melvin mentioned. Uh, just to remind you that we don't actually know <laughs> how, they are, how they got there. So that's a, a, a bit paradoxical situation. The only galactic nucleus that we can observe relatively well, the one in the Milky Way, uh, is a big riddle. It's a big mystery why these stars that are the closest, I mean, the one that we can observe the closest to the black hole just because they are bright, why they are there? Because in they cannot have formed there, or may, if they have formed, they have formed in a disk, which is uh, still considered as an exotic process, at least a process which is uh, not well understood. So this is, a, in some sense, a caveat, is that in all these modelings, we, we can predict rates of, uh, of uh, emeries, but we still cannot understand <laughs> this handful of stars that are well observed at the galactic center. But the plus side is that this might be used as a way to constrain the rates independently, because whatever is the process that brought the stars there, if you assume that it's generic, you know that these stars, these S stars, when they turn into compact remnants, which will be probably white dwarf and, or, and neutron stars, but not star black holes, these objects are perfectly uh, situated to become emeries. So just from the existence of these S stars, you may already find an indirect way, and completely different for all, uh, from all these uh, modeling that uh, that uh, Clovis and I and other people have done, an independent way to get some kind of estimate of uh, emery rates. Um, property of low mass object uh, continue. Well, uh, again, uh, I think I've said this before, uh, or Cole has said it, the spin uh, can probably not be measured, the spin of a small object, which apparently nobody cares much about, but I think for, if there were people uh, <laughs> Doing stellar uh, evolution here, they would find that's very bad. That's a, that's a pity, because I don't know there. Are, I don't think there are many other ways to measure the spin of a black hole, stellar black hole, and particularly not the more massive black hole. And there may be a connection with scenarios to form gamma ray bursts. So well, too bad. But maybe if it's well, that maybe an advertisement for the people that are computing waveforms and, and thinking about that analysis. I would advocate the fact that this is not. Uh, a detail in, in astrophysics. I think it's, it would be a, an interesting uh, output of LISA if this could be done. Uh, on the other hand, the spin should influence uh, the waveform in the case of IMRIS. So in principle, it should be detectable. Problem is that nobody knows how to compute the most generic case of an IMRI. So if, it, if it's not an extreme mass ratio, and you want to take into account spins of these two objects, and you want to take into account a non-zero eccentricity and non-equatorial uh, orbit, then uh, I understood that, uh, well, there is still work to be done, to put it mildly. And I think some people think it's hopeless in, uh, even within 10 years. But still, uh, it should be possible to say whether there is a spin or no spin. I mean, a rough es estimate of the spin might be... Uh, might be uh, attainable, which would be very interesting 
to constrain the formation and growth scenario for this, uh, these objects. Uh, and uh, as for, so now I've mentioned like individual events. <coughs> it will be relatively difficult, <laughs> to put it very mildly, <laughs> if not impossible to uh, invert the process. I mean, even if you have 1,000 emeries, you have one emery at most per galaxy. So for each emery, you have a different galaxy. So unless you assume uh, some kind of strong scaling between galaxies that you know exactly when you, you get from a galaxy harboring a 1,000 solar mass to a, uh, sorry, 1 million to a 10 to the 4, you know how to scale your initial conditions, and you know how the solar populations, how they will differ, or you, you assume they won't differ, it will be very difficult from this database of emeries to say something about, say, the initial uh, solar mass function in general. Again, there are things to be uh, said through correlations. If every time you find uh, that an emery into a massive, a more massive black hole corresponds to a more massive object, this is very interesting, a uh, more massive stellar black hole. Actually, you would ex expect the contrary because more massive black holes are in more extended galaxies with a longer uh, relaxation time, so probably mass aggregation should be less efficient. So there are still some correlation that you would expect, and if you don't find them, then indirectly that would tell you something. Another case is that if you don't see any <laughs> black hole in spiral, or very few, compared to the number of white dwarf or neutron star in spirals. Actually, I think with the standard rates, we don't expect to see any white dwarf or neutron star in spiral, or it's marginal. So uh, most emeries, I mean by a large factor, should be still a black hole. So of course, if this does not apply, then you, I mean, then there is something very important to investigate. Again, it will be difficult to, from this information, to, uh, to say something about the IMF. Well, probably you can still say that somehow you don't form stellar black holes in the galactic centers. But if you don't detect anything, of course, you don't know <laughs> what's wrong. Um, as for the properties of the massive high mass objects, again, mass and spin are in principle, easy to measure for each emery. The mass will, uh, the spin will tell us uh, about the uh, formation and growth mode of the black hole. What I'd like to know, I'm sure it has been done already. Well, we know that if the spin is high, we can conclude that most of them, well, uh, that accretion has been very important. What I wonder is that whether we can conclude that most of the mass of the black hole has been acquired by accretion, or if it's something. Uh, more subtle, like, okay, either most of the mass have been acquired by accretion in a long time and then just a few, uh, well, tidal disruption or whatever, or uh, you had a few tidal, dis well, a lot of tidal disruption for 90% of the mass and the 10 last person were acquired by accretion and still you would get to the maximum or nearly maximum ro uh, rotating care black hole. So I'm sure some of you know the answer, so just <laughs> remember this uh, for discussion. If uh, it's low, it's more difficult to say because it can be a measures or different accretion phases uh, with different disks which are not in the same plane. Uh, well, there is this bias that I, I mentioned already. Uh, oh, that's a point well, for discussion, really, is that I think X-ray observers or some of them would say, oh, but to detect if really you are after a spin of massive black holes, then uh, maybe you should support constellation X because through this iron line measurements, you could, in principle, measure the spin. I understood that it's very, very difficult to actually have good models for this, so, but I raise the point because I think, at least a few years ago, that was, well, by a few, I mean 10 years ago, I remember that people were saying, okay, we have to make a, po a strong point that Lisa is better than, say, constellation X for this aspect. Well, we have to <laughs> check whether it's the case. Uh, Okay, as for the mass function of, or the spin function of massive black holes, I think again it's difficult to inverse. And again, the best one can do, as Cole said, is to look at correlations and, and see whether every time a, mass, a massive black hole is in the high mass range, 10 to the 6, does it have a higher spin than the one that are less massive? And then we'll learn something, of course. But to say, okay, we have this list of inspirals, so we have a distribution of massive black of the mass of the massive black hole for the observer in spiral from this 
to uh, infer a distribution of massive black holes in galaxies in general, I think that would be very difficult because, because again, you have to understand, uh, well, all the stellar dynamics, basically, around the massive black hole for different kind of galaxies. By the way, for the time being, we don't really know <laughs> how many black holes there are in, the, in this mass range, but uh, I think a good way, I mean, I think this will be much more constrained by the way uh, lizards fly for different reasons, but one reason is that uh, people now are actually actively looking, or there are projects to look uh, at uh, tidal disruption events, and there are good reasons to think that tidal disruption, so when uh, the main second stars come very close to a black hole, it's tidally shredded, and half of the mass, or a big fraction of the mass is accreted, so you will get a a flare of accretion, and these events are supposed to occur more often in smaller galaxies with smaller black holes, so it's a way to actually have a handle on this population. Uh, I think I will probably jump over this, skip this because, uh, well, that's basically what Cole said. And well, I think uh, maybe Melvin, if we have time after, you, you should advertise your, uh, what you, uh, you suggested. Namely, I mean, it, it's something which would be easy to, to do and probably very interesting in the context of, uh, um, of cosmology with actually not MREs. Again, we, we think that MREs are not uh, the best tool, but MREs or, or equivalent, well, comparable mass ratio objects is to know for a given mass and, well, as a function of the mass of the black hole, how far in redshift one can detect the object to see in, uh, well, in a merger tree of a given galaxy what phases are actually uh, reachable by LISA. Okay, now I get to the point where we have discussed a, a bit more than the other group, but where I'm not at all a specialist, so uh, probably I will say a lot of <laughs> wrong things. So what I understood is that it's very difficult, it may be impossible or out of reach to strictly test the GR with MREs because you want to compare with another theory and say, okay, GR is better than this other theory. That's what I understood people meant by a strict test, so, so to speak. But as I understood, there are no other theory of gravitation which is taken seriously, which is at the same time taken seriously, which always deviates significantly from GR, so it will make a prediction which, uh, which you can really test, and for which uh, inspiral trajectories and waveforms can be computed. And it seems that many people are not really eager to do it <laughs> because it's so much work for something that, well, well, I don't know, that's something to discuss, but I, I imagine it's a lot of work for something that you, most people think will be negative at the end. But at the same time, we were reminded that uh, Lee, uh, that's, Testing GR is officially one of the main goals of LISA. But I think we should be more pragmatic and rather than test GR in a strong sense, test the consistency of GR. So what I mean is that if MREs are detected and they are to the level of precedent, they are Kerb MREs, I mean MREs around the Kerb black hole, then, and this I understood can be tested uh, really uh, qualitatively by measuring multiples and, uh, and or or position parameters, or testing for the presence of horizon, uh, then it means that gravitational uh, general relativity and care are confirmed. Of course, it could be that GR is wrong, and just by chance, the other theory has other objects that will produce the same kind of inspulse. But I think this is, uh, and well, I don't know if it's unlikely, but <laughs> I don't think it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing to consider. And it's not testable by definition. Okay. Uh, I wonder, um, not personally, but I think this has been raised, that maybe a merger between two massive black holes are actually better suited or equally well suited to make this kind of test. My comment is that these rates are also very uncertain. So I think it's very good not to put all eggs in the same basket and have two different ways of testing or the, the coherence or uh, yeah, the coherence of GR and, the, and care uh, paradigm. If you know. Now, if some deviation is found, but it's not so strong as to, uh, to render detection impossible, then that's very exciting, I think. Then, okay, 
we cannot say whether we have or not tested GR, but we can start working on other possibilities, other theories, or a non care geometry, including actually uh, including care, a dirty care black hole, so care with some stuff around it, some standard astrophysical stuff. I will mention it on the last slide. But maybe, well, that's uh, <laughs> the worst uh, scenario, but still, uh, I think it's not, well, it has to be uh, at least kept in mind. If uh, MREs are strongly non care but, but the rate that we compute, well, the, the rate that you would detect if they were care is of order 10 per least emission, then they will, I think, most of them be very far away, so there won't be anything very bright. So if it's very different from K, I, I understand that you wouldn't need, in principle, much filtering to detect it if it's so far, but then it won't work if it's not K. So that may be the worst possible scenario. And this rate is actual, well, this rate is not, it's one, I mean, it's a, in the range of rates that have been published. It's on the lower end, I call them. So I was a bit surprised that everybody was very enthusiastic. Oh, no, there is no problem, because there will always be a bright one. So I wonder, I mean, if there are only 10, how bright will be the brightest? Will it be bright enough that you don't need, um, you, you don't need much filtering to uh, actually detect it, and then you can see what it is? OK, last slide. So that's not really testing GR and CARE, but it's really complementary that can we detect a dirty uh, black hole? So uh, what about uh, the entrance of a disk or other stars? So apparently, people are confident that um, if you have like a care black hole with a very massive disk around, I mean, as mass so massive as to, to make a difference, still it won't look like a boson star. So we will know, OK, it's still care. But there is some stuff around. Uh, perturbation by other stars seem very likely for 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 a variety of reasons. But one I, which I think is uh, maybe uh, the most compelling is that the duty cycle, well, <coughs> is of order the time of inspiral, the, the time uh, a source stays in the Lisbon, times the rate of captures. And if I'm quite optimistic, the time will be. 10,000 years, <laughs> it's very optimistic. And uh, the rate is of order, well, 1, 10 million years. That's also very optimistic. And still, this is much smaller than 1. So it means that you cannot have two MREs at the same time. And even if you had, they will diverge, I think, qu quickly from each other. That's my point here. So what remains to be tested, but I think I can guess the, the result is that if you have an emery and another object which is far enough not to be an emery, not to inspall even in one million years, can it still produce an influence? I guess not, because that would be just 10 solar mass, which is at a much larger distance. As for perturbation by uh, an accretion disk, I understood from all the discussion, which was quite long, uh, that the jury is still out. <laughs> It seems unlikely because you would need so much mass to still have an influence at this small distance that the, the accretion disk should evolve very fast. Uh, my only point here is that I don't see it as a concern for Lisa in the sense that, okay, we haven't, we are not able to compute this, so we may miss events. Because I think this can be an issue only if you have the most po massive uh, uh, accretion disk that you can imagine. So if you have, I guess, an object accreting uh, some kind of low luminosity gene accreting an Eddington luminosity. But I think observationally we know that at most maybe it's 30% of galaxies, of the small galaxies that we're interested uh, in for LISA that are Aegeans. I'm not sure about this, this number that was uh, Monica's guess <laughs> yesterday night. <coughs> so, okay, in the worst possible case, we will miss 30% of events. So I don't think if this makes a big uh, difference, it means that we, <laughs> we are in trouble anyway because the, the total number of, of ob or events is very low. So I don't think it can, it can prevent the detection of MREs, but maybe it's interesting to study properties of disks. And uh, that's a point that Melvin raised. 
is that also in, a, in an object like uh, AGN where you have an accretion disk, then the stars will collide with the disk. Can this actually change the population of stars by destroying giants, say, so that you, you stop uh, cell evolution and you never form cellular black holes? So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of uh, skeptical, but maybe it's something interesting to, uh, uh, to consider. All right. That's all. Thanks.
that we do sometimes lean over a little bit backwards in the direction of saying, but it's possible we won't see a particular kind of source. This is a separate comment. I really think one of the strengths uh, is that we do have sort of these three major types of sources involving uh, massive black holes. And it seems to me the chances of none of the three showing up with a reasonable event rate are quite small. And I think that uh, adds a lot of robustness to the case for going ahead and making the measurement. I'm um, talking about three. I'm talking about the mass block hole binary coalescences, the inter intermediate mass objects, however one tests them. But their absence would have strong significance if we don't see them.
simplification.